Forests are ambivalent places, both beautiful and tranquil, yet also dangerous to the unwary. They've always been a source of resources for people, which is either embraced or exploited. As a result, there's a whole class of folklore involving forest protectors, spirits who guard the woods and all the animals within. These protectors ensure that humans never take more than they should and keep the forest in balance. Now, not all forest-dwelling spirits and gods are guardians of the forest. Dryads are the spirits of specific trees. So in this episode, we're more interested in spirits that protect the forest. They are the ones who punish greedy humans or lead those with ill intention out of the way. So let's go and meet the Leshy, the Woodwives and even the Pangolin in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are finishing off our forest folklore theme, and this time we're doing forest protectors. And as I said in the introduction, I have had to focus more on forest guardians and not just forest spirits, and there is a difference. I should also point out that I have covered Sylvanus before, who was obviously the Roman god of the forest, and there are also some forest protectors in rebel folklore, so I'm not going to be dwelling on Mumma Paduri, Papa Bois, the Mapinguari, or La Madramonte in this week's episode, because they are all in rebel folklore. So instead, we're going to be having a look at the Leshy, the Woodwives, the Pangolin, and a couple of other ones from around the world that are especially interesting. So we're going to start off with the Leshy, who is a forest spirit in Slavic mythology, and he's the one who often pops up in hashtags on Twitter about folklore, so I think he's probably one of the better known ones. Now, he protects the forest and its animals, and many people consider the Leshy to be a trickster, particularly for his shape-shifting abilities. So he might appear to someone as a man to confuse someone in the forest or to lead them astray. So one particular favourite trick was to lead them right into the centre of the woods, where he would then abandon them with a laugh. And sometimes the Leshy didn't even actually need to appear in order to lead someone astray, because sometimes he would manipulate the forest so an unwary traveller might find each path looking the same, That said, the Leshy was a trickster, not malevolent, so if the traveller actually had genuine intentions, so say they were just passing through, the Leshy might actually make the true path appear and guide the traveller back to a safe route, and with any luck, the traveller would have learned a lesson. Now, descriptions of his appearance vary. In some accounts, he has pale green skin, other ones it appears to be grey or blue. Most descriptions see him appear in some kind of humanoid way, albeit one that's missing a right ear, eyebrows and eyelashes. But despite this, the Leshy is more often heard than seen, either laughing or singing. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about Leshy is whilst in the forest, he would stand as tall as a tree, but if he left, he would then become the height of a blade of grass. So he very much alters his appearance to suit his environment. Now you can actually invoke the Leshy, so what you would do is you would cut down young birch trees and then you would put them in a circle with the tops pointing towards the centre. You would then enter this circle of birch trees and you would invoke the spirit. The invocation isn't actually included anywhere, which I think is probably for the best. But then you would step back out of the circle onto one of the birch stumps. You would turn your face to the east and actually bend over to look between your legs. And if you manage to do all of that, you would say, Uncle Leshy, ascend thou, not as a grey wolf, not as an ardent fire, but as resembling myself. And having done so, the Leshy would then appear in the circle, in human form, and you'd also do whatever it was that you'd invoked him to do. There is obviously a price, because they're always in, nothing comes for free in folklore, and you would have to more or less give him your soul for this. So if you were going to invoke him for something, you would need to make sure you did it for a good reason. Now, it should be said that people entering the forest for practical reasons like hunting or searching for firewood could still do so, but they should leave offerings to the Leshy and that would show him that you understood the rules of the forest and weren't going to overstep the boundaries. Otherwise, the Leshy would work to keep the forest in balance. So we're going to move on to the Woodwives and I really like the Woodwives. I'm going to say that in advance, just I think they're a really, really interesting group of spirits and they lived in ancient forests and they're a little bit like dryads in that their lives depend on the forest being healthy but unlike dryads they don't seem to be tied to specific trees. 
Now, they often appear in German folklore, particularly from southern Germany, but you do get some from northern Germany and also Scandinavia as well. And they're described as being tiny, beautiful, pale, and they usually wear blue, red or green dresses. The red one I found really interesting because red is usually a bit of a warning sign in the world of fairy, but in this case it seems to just be a colour that they particularly like wearing. In some ways, the woodwives are similar to the Skogsgra of Sweden, except the Skogsgra actually had claws instead of fingernails. And they were actually friendly to anyone that they encountered, apart from hunters. But savvy hunters knew that if you left a portion of your catch for the Skogsgra, she would more or less let you go without any problems. Now, back to the woodwives. They apparently sat in the court of the ancient gods in their sacred forests, so they do have a really long lineage in these particular stories. But in terms of folklore, they were generally benevolent. So if you lived in the forest or you were living along its edge and you were baking, you could pretty much expect a woodwife to turn up at some point and she would ask you to bake her a cake. And if you did so, she would leave a purse of wood chips behind. But what you basically did was you left them for a little while and they would actually turn into gold coins. What's really cool though is unlike fairy gold, which habitually turns back into leaves, these particular coins would never change form unless you told someone how you came by them. So as long as you just accepted that they were gold, then they were. You could also earn these gold coins by fixing the tools of the woodwives, broken wheelbarrows seems to be a favourite, or by giving them something to eat from your pot. So it does rather feel like people had quite a good relationship with the woodwives, as long as everybody was kind of nice to each other, which I think is a really good story that we can probably learn from them. Now, the Derna Veebel lived in Bavaria, and she usually wore white, although in one particular forest she actually wore red. And this woodwife wandered the forest, and she always did so carrying a basket of apples with her, and she was always quite happy to hand it over to someone. And it was a good idea to accept it if she offered it to you, because it would then turn to gold as well. The downside was she would then ask whoever the recipient was to accompany her, If you refused, you would make her cry, which to me just feels like the worst thing in the world that you could do, but she would then return to the wood. But it was actually quite a good idea to help the woodwives if you did come across them, and there is a legend that tells of a poet who met a woodwife in the forest, and during their interaction she asked if he would go with her, he actually agreed, and she took him to Dame Charity's tower. And then he had a chat with Dame Charity and sent him away with a bunch of treasure. So it was obviously worth going with the woodwife with this particular request of hers. Nothing bad seems to happen to people when they go with the woodwives either. So again, it's like, unless you're like super short of time, probably best to go with them. Which is unusual. I don't usually advise that when it comes to things to do with spirits. But in this case, probably a good one. Now, woodcutters actually grew quite fond of the woodwives. And to be fair, like, they do sound quite sweet in a lot of the stories. And I sort of feel like any spirit that's going to approach me while I'm baking and say, can you make us a cake? Like, we already share some kind of cake-based bond there. So I'm, like, clearly going to be predisposed towards them. But woodcutters would actually cut crosses into tree stumps, which would then help the woodwives during the wild hunt. Because one of the unfortunate parts of the woodwives, and this isn't really any of their fault, but during the wild hunt, the huntsmen would chase them through the forest for sport. But the wives could actually hide in these cross-marked tree stumps. So as long as the woodcutter, when he cut a tree down, cut these three crosses in, it gave the woodwife somewhere to hide. And to me, that does feel a little bit like the woodcutter is marking the stumps as a way of paying something back to the forest that was giving them a living. And also, if you're doing that to help the woodwives, then they're going to be a bit more predisposed to you considering you're cutting down their trees. So it's worth bearing that in mind as well. Now, over on the Haunted Palace blog, Miss Jessel does make the point that the Wild Hunt did suffer something of a PR crisis with the coming of Christianity and originally it was more about ancient gods but they were then turned into demonic spirits intent on evil sport and in this newer version the huntsman and his identity did change depending on the story the huntsman is sometimes someone who's been cursed for bad behaviour they hated the woodwives and all that they stood for so where the woodwives protected the forest and all life within it the huntsman simply wanted to destroy Now that said, there are some stories in which the huntsman met a sticky end, which was believed to be the work of angry woodwives intent on protecting the forest. And huntsmen in particular seemed to suffer at the hands of woodwives, and stories spread around Germany of hunters found with their throats cut during the 16th and 17th centuries. Yes, there could have been another explanation for that, but I do think the fact that it was attributed to woodwives does say a lot about perhaps how much hunting was happening at the time. 
Now, there are also tales of the moss folk who are confusingly sometimes called woodwives as well. And the moss folk in particular would actually come to humans for help or to borrow things. And anybody that actually helped them would receive gifts or useful advice as payment. So again, they're almost a form of fairy-like folk, but they're more in the nature spirit category. And again, it's a good idea to help them out because they will actually pay you back with something useful. So again, quite, quite good to help them. Now, compared to the woodwives, who are obviously described as being these tiny, beautiful women, people considered the moss folk to be dwarfs, and they actually often lived in groups, whereas the woodwives seemed to be quite solitary. The moss folk were grey, often looked old, and they were overgrown with moss. And in some descriptions, it's like long grey strands of lichen form their hair and stuff, and they do sound pretty cool. Now, they often tended to sick animals, and they would also help people find medicinal plants in the forest during times of plague. But if anyone refused to help or refused their payment, then they would get angry. Like the woodwives, they're not quite forest protectors in the same way that the leshy is, but I do think that the moss folk help to represent the dual nature of the forest. So on one hand, it can provide all of these bountiful resources, and on the other, it contains things that can and will kill you, which I think is obviously worth bearing in mind. But they are guardians of the forest in the way, I guess, the fact that they're trying to build good relationships with humans, which I guess would make people more predisposed towards them, and therefore less likely to cause harm. Now, there are obviously other spirits and deities, and this is in no way a comprehensive overview. They're just the ones that kind of jumped out while I was looking for this particular topic. There was one called Polk, who lived in the Kammerforst, which is some 103 miles northeast of Frankfurt, and he chastised anyone who injured the trees or stole wood. And likewise, large numbers of the Waldgeister lived in ancient forest in Germany, which literally just means forest spirits, and some had a benevolent nature, and others were more malevolent as well. Now, the Waldgeister knew the secrets of medicinal plants, and there was a particular one called the Hildemoer, or Elder Mother, who lived in elder trees, as you might imagine, and obviously there is an episode on elder. She avenged any damage done to elder trees, and if you wanted to cut down an elder, you actually had to seek the Hildemoer's permission first. In Estonia, you had the Metzik, who lived in aspen trees in the forest. People apparently held them in such awe that they actually wouldn't break off tree branches or even pick flowers if they fell in the shadow of an aspen tree. The Metzik hid in their trees' roots during a thunderstorm. Like other forest guardians, like the Leshy, the Metzik would lead anyone away who wanted to cut down trees or set fires. Meanwhile, in Finland, all wild animals in the forest belonged to Tapio, the forest god, Hunters had to seek his permission before venturing into the forest on a hunt, and they would also make offerings to encourage Tapio to send game their way. Most surprisingly, I think, of all where Tapio is concerned, he also protected domestic cattle, which kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the things associated with Sylvanus, but Tapio protected them whether they were in their stall or they'd wandered into the forest. So that's quite cool. And then we have the Kurupira of Brazil, who will likewise ensure any who come into the rainforest with destruction in their minds finds themselves lost. Now, he took the form of a young boy, often with ginger hair, with backwards facing feet, and they helped to create false trails that would confuse humans. And he was often blamed when people disappeared in the forest. Now, he's quite interesting because his stories date to the days of colonisation, so it is possible that he appeared as a counterbalance to the deforestation that began in the wake of incoming Europeans. But finally, we're going to finish off with the pangolin. And it might seem a little bit strange to see the pangolin alongside figures like Leshy and Sylvanus, because obviously pangolins are actual creatures that we can see and touch and so on. We probably shouldn't, because obviously they are wild animals. But I did get the idea to include them when Wild Aid called them forest guardians on Instagram. Now, I absolutely love pangolins, so I'm massively biased. But they're guardians in a literal sense because their fondness of ants and termites in their diet actually protects trees and promotes soil health in the forest, so they're a really important part of their ecosystem. Pangolins are the world's only scaled mammal, and they're also the most trafficked mammal, currently risking extinction. And both habitat loss and the trade for both their meat and scales mean that we do actually risk losing this really shy mammal altogether. But because they appear in folklore, I thought it was interesting to have a look at how they appear in mythology as well. And their scientific name, Manus, comes from Manus in Latin, which means ghost or spirit of the dead, which apparently refers to their nocturnal life, but also how mysterious people found them, because you don't really see mammals with scales. And because they, they can roll up into a ball to sort of protect their softer underparts and everything, they do seem almost reptilian, but like I say, they are a mammal. Now, in some parts of Tanzania, the Sangu people believe the pangolins actually fell from the sky, dispatched by their ancestors. 
and every pangolin latched onto a person when they arrived and then followed them home. So if you were chosen by a pangolin, you would undergo special rituals, which included singing and dancing. And if the pangolin cried while dancing, this was an omen for rain in the coming year, which, as you can imagine, would obviously be quite helpful. Zimbabwe law sees pangolins appear as a good luck symbol, meaning it would be bad luck to kill one. And meanwhile, in Taiwanese law from the Kanakanavu people, the pangolin rescued a woman thrown into a ravine by her husband. So the woman, named Pei, held on to the pangolin's tail as he tunnelled back to her village and brought her back to safety. And finally, in Sao mythology, the pangolin plays the role of a trickster. So he made a bet with a fox over who could survive a fire. The fox stood amid the burning grass, basically catching fire himself, but the pangolin burrowed underneath to safety. Now, it's not all bad because the pangolin did then put out the flames and save the fox's life once he won the bet. I rather think he made the bet knowing he was going to win. Now, whatever the mythology, these shy creatures are absolutely vital to the health of the forest and to their ecosystem. And I think in some cases, they're going to need every scrap of help they can get if they're going to survive, which means we need to become their guardians. So what do we make of these forest protectors? Well, forests are quite complex ecosystems, which I think if you listen to particularly the trees and fungi episodes, you'll know how much these different organisms essentially work together to make the forest actually work as a whole. And if forests are left alone, often they'll kind of balance themselves out, but too often humans interfere and then knock that balance completely out of kilter. So it's hardly surprising that people might have considered forest guardians to be both benevolent and dangerous depending on your intentions. So if you only wanted a little bit of firewood and maybe some food for the pot and you gave some offerings to the guardians then they might actually lead you to a forest bounty. But if you were killing for sport or destroying swathes of the forest you would only anger these guardians. Now it is unclear obviously how much people genuinely feared reprisals but the threat of such elemental anger is certainly a potent one. But of course now such threats are likely to be met with laughter rather than respect. And in Britain in particular, and this is a soapbox I will never tire of getting up onto, developers can essentially cut down established ancient forests, claiming that they'll just replant trees elsewhere, but that is no actual replacement because saplings cannot do the job of mature trees and it's so destructive to remove an established habitat with the promise of a new one that can't replicate the original. For one thing, you can't move all of the other animals and plants and so on that depend on these trees and it does take a really long time for a forest to actually get established as well. And also remember, trees take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into oxygen for free. They do this all day long. They lower temperatures, they make things a little bit less dry. Basically, trees are brilliant, so we shouldn't really be cutting forests down. But with this mindset of the developers alive and well in the 21st century, the best forest protectors in the British Isles are often ordinary people, and we ultimately need to be our own forest guardians. So what I want to know is which of these forest guardians are your favourite? Have you read Rebel Folklore and therefore come across the extra forest protectors that are in there as well? let me know. It's always nice to hear from people. If you've got any photos of your favourite forests, again, please feel free to share those with me. I love seeing photos of new places. It's always brilliant. You can always send them to me on Instagram, tag me on threads or whatever, or Twitter. I'm still on all the platforms that you find us usually somewhere. Next month, we're going to be having a look at folklore of sort of trying to think the best way of putting it. We're going to be looking at things like standing stones and stone circles and all that kind of thing. So it's kind of almost like specifically folkloric kind of places and I can already say that the episode of Fabulous Folklore Presents I'm really going to be excited about is going to involve Atlantis so that one is going to be so much fun to do so I'll tell you more about that nearer the time but yeah that's what we're going to be having a look at in March. If you've got any specific locations you'd like me to have a look at obviously please do let me know usual channels and everything and that's all good. Also I have drawn the winner of the Fabulous Folklore Turns 5 competition so it Obviously, I've removed the link for that from the show notes because that's no longer open. And I have emailed the winners, so you should hopefully get an email if you were successful. Remember, March is also my birthday month as well. So if anyone wants to buy me any extra coffees or whatever, it's always appreciated. But anyway, that is enough from me. I will see you next month for our Folklore Places, I guess, theme. And I hope you have a marvellous week ahead. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes 
So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.